I think the greatest story is that Khrushchev once said he only feared two things. One, that there might really be a God, and two, was strategic air command. And I would say that bespeaks deterrence more eloquently than anything I've ever heard before. Deterrence is not an exclusively military concept. It's part of everyday human interaction. We have different competing interests. We have different ways we would like to see the world. And we try to influence others to basically go along with the way we'd like to see things happen. And that's part of what makes deterrence difficult, is that deterrence is successful when nothing happens. And so it's very hard to measure. I don't think anybody can answer what will be in the future. I think one can suggest that probably a failure to maintain an adequate deterrent force uh, in the form of a triad is probably the most useful and uh, the most effective form of deterrence. Effective, in, by my definition, means it will be credible and reliable. So if you have a force that is safe, secure, and effective, i.e. credible and reliable, then you have a force as we've defined it in the nuclear posture review as a triad of submarines, bombers, and ICBMs, a force that mitigates risk, and a force that then ensures strategic stability. Global Strike for the Air Force and then the Navy are all looking to update and modernize the, the nuclear arsenal. For the Air Force, it's the Long Range Strike Bomber that will be out there that will replace the B-52 and the B-2. Global Strike's looking at a replacement for the, for the uh, ICBM. There's a new cruise missile that's being looked at. I know the Navy's also looking at replacing their nuclear submarine with an Ohio-class submarine. We, I want you to think about a, a conflict pyramid. If you think of, of a pyramid, and at the top of that pyramid is the capstone. And that capstone is nuclear conflict. That is the absolute worst form of conflict that you could have. And beneath that, that second layer, is large-scale conventional war, World War I, World War II. And beneath that is what you could call lesser combat operations. So Vietnam, for example, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. And then beneath that, you could think of something like insurgency, which that could also be Vietnam. Uh, and beneath that, at the very bottom of the pyramid, that, that longest level, but at the bottom, is, is terrorism, as we generally think of it. So at the top is the worst case, but least likely. At the bottom is the least dangerous, so most dangerous, least dangerous, but most likely. So when you're talking about trying to deter terrorists or non-state actors, uh, one, they usually exist within a much larger social context. So we can concentrate on how many foreign fighters in, or maybe one area of Syria, but the even more interesting question is where are they all coming from? What is causing them to want to basically collect in this one area to fight in support of their ideology. People like ISIL have been around for a long time. Al-Saladin wiped out the assassins in the 12th century on the ground with a conventional force and they were very much like these people, perhaps not as numerous, but uh, I think that uh, ISIL is a, it's a real threat to pinprick us regularly, hurt us, maybe even make us look bad. It's a real nuisance, it's a real problem, and it's very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, and we've got to deal with it. But it, deterring it is probably not a very effective approach. You're going to have to do something more than to deter them. Uh, I think you could, it's, a, it's a whole different kind of problem. But it ultimately gets down to two really key things. It's theories of mind, how do individuals process information and make decisions at a singular individual level, and then two, how do groups of people make collective decisions? And both of those require understanding of psychology of the human brain. So while it seems like an inherently intractable problem, we're not totally without guideposts. As Colin Gray, modern theorist, has said that the nature of war is constant, but the character is, uh, is constantly changing. So the nature of war is about the human element. It's about essentially how people have always been. It's what we can read from the classical theorists all the way to the cognitive neurosciences today. What drives people to make decisions? What is the, uh, the basis of their motivations? How does social identity drive what people fight for, what people take risks for? I guess the only thing I would say is um, deterrence is resurgent. It was passe for about two decades but both an interest 
and a need for an understanding of deterrence is it's really returning. And Air University and the Air Force are making a distinct effort to improve the understanding of airmen in regards to deterrence, both conventional and nuclear, and in the new realms of cyber.